Welcome, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Aloni, and I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is one of the largest media outlets in local media outlets in the New York metro area. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events throughout Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, the Bronx, Westchester, Long Island, and Philadelphia. Today, we are thrilled to be able to bring you the topic of neurodiversity in the workplace, LD, autism, and ADHD pathways to success. We have illustrious guests here today to join us, and I wanted to welcome all of them. Welcome, everybody. Please note that when you're watching this webinar, you can choose the speaker view or the gallery view. The gallery view will allow you to see everybody at once and the speaker view will allow you to highlight the speaker as they are speaking. Let me go ahead and introduce all of our wonderful guests. I'd like to get started with Jan Coplin. Jan serves as the Director of Career Connections at Landmark College. She's passionately committed to creating greater awareness of the advantages of individuals with learning differences that they bring to the workplace. She's working to increase the number of professional work experiences for neurodiverse individuals, both locally and nationwide, including placements at Hasbro, JP Morgan Chase, Microsoft, SAP, Dell, and EY. She's participated in several of Microsoft's Autism at Work summits in Redmond, Washington, and has been interviewed several times about the support individuals with autism need to enter the workforce. Jan is a member of the Executive Steering Committee for the College's Center of Neurodiversity and serves as chair of its Partnership Building Committee, Committee, played an instrumental role in Landmark College becoming the first neurodiversity hub, which is a collaborative to create employment opportunities for neurodivergent students in the United States and was appointed as an advisor to the hub in the fall of 2018. Welcome, Jan. Thank you. Great to be here. Happy to have you here. I'd next like to welcome Solvegi Smolski. Solvegi is a professor of psychology and the director of the Center for Neurodiversity. She spent two decades teaching neurodiverse college students, individuals who think and learn differently because of LD, ADHD, autism, and other invisible disabilities. She teaches courses in positive psychology, emotion, adolescent and adult development, social identity development, and diversity psychology at Landmark College. Her research has focused on identifying effective post-secondary practices for neurodivergent students. She has written and published more than a dozen academic articles about neurodiversity in a college setting. Welcome, Sylvegi. Next up, I'd like to introduce Jamel G. Mitchell. Jamel has been with EY for over 16 years and serves as the global NCOE ecosystem and community engagement leader. Jamel is responsible for securing talent, driving support and awareness, in addition to identifying learning opportunities that align the neurodiversity COES to the firm's service lines. He manages teams across the U.S., drives best practices and procedures, analyzes budget reports within and outside of the space of neurodiversity. Jamel sits on the board of trustees for Hilltop Preparatory School in Rosemont, Pennsylvania. He has an MBA with specific focus on leadership and finance from Walden University, Minneapolis, and holds a BS in College Justice Administration and Planning from John Jay College in New York. Welcome, Jamel. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Lastly, a big welcome to Anthony Basilio. Anthony is a Vice President and Global Head of Autism at Work for J.P. Morgan Chase. In his role, he manages recruiting efforts as well as developing candidate pipelines and ensuring best practices for ongoing support. Anthony has been, been with JPNC for eight years, serving in a variety of technological roles in consumer and community banking. Prior to joining JPMC, he held various positions in the finance and healthcare industry. Anthony's previous companies include MBNA America, Bank of America, and Cigna. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. Absolutely. So let's jump right in as this is an important, certainly an important topic. So I wanted to ask a question, start out with asking a question of all of you. 
Um, what circumstances prevent companies from recruiting individuals with autism, ADHD, and other learning disabilities? And how does that eliminate these individuals from employment consideration, even though their skills might be a very good fit for the company? Why don't we get started with Anthony on that? Sure. Uh, I can give you a couple of uh, examples how that might not uh, bode well for somebody who might be neurodiverse. I think one of the first things, if you don't have a program or an office of disability inclusion, um, you know, there, there's not the infrastructure set up to do that for one, to build training and education and internal support. I think the other big thing from a recruiting perspective is what does the requisition look like? Right, so a lot of the times, and, and Jamel has heard me say this a thousand times, Jamel and I kind of do the circuit together uh, on these sort of things, is that, you know, sometimes we ask for 10 years of experience and, uh, you know, we ask for basket weaving and things that are not necessarily germane to the job itself. Uh, so I think if we kind of relook at what we're putting out there, right, sometimes folks who are on the spectrum, it's a black and white issue. If they don't have the 10 years, they're opting out. Our job right now is to make individuals opt in and say that EY and JP Morgan Chase and Microsoft, those are the companies that are doing it right. Uh, and we also need to expand how we tell other mid-sized, small mom and pop companies how we need to do this. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a good fit and then there's the motivational fit too, though. Uh, and I'll be brief on this one, right? So you can line up the, the job skills and whatnot to, to a job, but I think you know the person needs to have a motivation to, to wanna work at JP Morgan Chase, to wanna work at EY. Um, and I think you know us being public about it, going out and doing these things and collaboration from Landmark College, this is how we get the word out that these companies are really trying to get this untapped talent back into the pipeline. So I'll turn it over to, I think, uh, Jamel. Jamel, I would love to hear your, your take on it. Yeah, I, I think that Anthony hit on some of the, you know, topics that I also would share. And as he pointed out, you know, he and I actually, you know, participate in so many panels together because we are so passionate about this topic. But when you look back and you say, what are some of the barriers that would prevent individuals with, you know, um, a, a diagnosis or identification of autism or ADHD or others um, for gaining opportunity? It's, I would say our existing processes, right? So existing processes that we have really don't interview for how well a person might be able to do the job in as much as would they interview for an ability for a person to showcase their uh, opportunities to socialize the way that you do, right? So nodding appropriately, um, smiling appropriately, giving direct eye contact, um, giving you know the right amount of pause, but not enough pause. And if you are a person that's neurodivergent, those might be challenges for you that you may not be able to um, kind of pick up on some social cues, but you may be able to do the job well, and the social cues have nothing to do with the job. So I would say to answer the question directly, one of the barriers or circumstances that prevent individuals that are neurodivergent from getting opportunity is our existing processes that we're working on and working through changing quite honestly. It's such a great point. Do you even think about just from start, from just start, get from the get-go, there's can be a, a, a stop point before the person's ever able to really show that they're a perfect fit. Absolutely, Elizabeth. I mean, and I, I think that in itself is unfortunately um, one of the barriers that companies have because in an attempt, so we believe to screen talent in you actually are screening them out if you are so hardwired and rigid to those existing processes, wherein if you don't shake the hand appropriately um, and give it enough force, but not enough, um, that that person may not be a good fit or if I'm not looking directly at you or if it takes me a little bit longer um, to process how I'm responding to a question, those have been some of the um, barriers and circumstances that have helped individuals not get opportunities that they were well suited for. That's a critical piece to highlight, absolutely. So Becky, what about you? Um, what can you share with us about what prevents companies from recruiting these individuals? Yeah, I probably, I'll take a slightly different tack because I don't have a company hiring perspective, but as a faculty member who's worked with students, emerging adults for decades, 
um, emerging adults who have these variations. I would say I've met so many talented, really bright, really interesting and creative people, but they have without um, exception, pretty much experienced adversity and been kind of batted around in the education system, haven't had good experiences because of their differences. And so it's not uncommon to have self-esteem problems and for students to not really know their own value. And so I would say one of the barriers is students not even believing that they have these opportunities or that they should write the email or take the step to reach out because they don't know themselves necessarily and believe in themselves enough. So the kind of programs that um, we're talking about today are really wonderful because they signal to people, hey, this might be an avenue for me. And you know, the people I work with on a day-to-day -day basis don't necessarily know that. That's a great point. I mean, what's more important than you within you knowing that you have the wherewithal to be able to succeed and being able to give people those tools, really that knowing is, is golden. That's a really great point. Jen, can you share with us some of your thoughts on this? A lot of um, has been covered, but I would just say, you know, in the, some of the barriers my students face is the actual process to apply that they so we've mentioned the, the there's so much reliance on in the interview um, and that doesn't always speak to the strengths of um, some of our individuals who are on the spectrum i always encourage my students to show it don't feel like you have to say it you know do you have a portfolio do you have examples of your work so employers being open to you know looking at examples um, but also i mean even just you know other neurodivergent um, aspects of like the individual who has a dyslexic diagnosis, if he opens up an application that is overwhelmingly long with numerous questions that have to be written out and a lot of content that has to be read, they shut down. So that's not an accessible process. So thinking about that, and even somebody who's, you know, has an ADHD diagnosis, that type of um, intense application process, they're, they're, they're gonna bail. They're not gonna, they're not gonna engage. So just making the entire process accessible and showing it versus having to constantly write it or convey it in an interview, I think is, is huge. Yeah, and, and showing, you know, having companies understand something that they might not have realized that are, is a barrier to them finding the right people for their, for their jobs is, is just in something like that. Um, so educating companies is really so critical on, on, on where they're making mistakes that they don't even realize. Um, so Peggy, I would love for you to share with us, kind of taking a step back, um, what is neurodiversity and what does it have to do with the workplace so we can all be on the same page of understanding? Sure thing, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll start off with my experience with students. Um, students have to really look at themselves when they come to college because they've often not done so well academically. So they have to look hard. We're always talking about their profiles, their attention, their executive function, their ability in social situations. And so talking about difference is a big part of our culture. Now, when I use the word neurodiversity to describe those differences, the emerging adults I work with love that term. They love that term because it's not negative. It's not about deficits. It do, it's not that something's wrong with them. So they just intuitively really love it. Um, and the way that we use it at the college is in relation to the neurodiversity movement, which has the same non-negative meaning that you know, my students take the word to mean, which is that different ways of thinking and acting and being are a normal part of the human spectrum and they should all be respected and accepted and integrated and that the way to work with you know greater inclusion is to think about neurodiversity from a diversity and inclusion perspective not from a disability and cure or and treatment perspective students find that very liberating and i think um, I, can, I won't speak for workplaces, but I think one of the potential values is that it opens up a diversity and inclusion way of thinking about incorporating a diverse workforce rather than, oh dear, what do we have to do with this employee who needs something to help them with their emails? Um, so I think it brings up a, a more empowering and respectful way of, of making a diverse team. 
Yeah, I could imagine, you know, it, it's really about labels make a big difference to all of us um, and, and how we see ourselves. And so, you know, having a way to describe oneself as that, that is not, it doesn't have a negative connotation is so incredibly powerful. Um, and for companies to be able to understand that it's a difference, just like anybody else has a difference, um, also makes, makes such an important distinction in the workplace. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that understanding about that. Um, Jamel and Anthony, what sort of structured employment programs for neurodivergent individuals do your companies provide? You, you've created such a, a wonderful way to do that. And I know a lot of other companies would be interested in, in doing so as well. So could you share some of that with us? Absolutely. And, and Elizabeth, before we go to the, some of the structured programs that we've created as an entry point for um, the neurodivergent individuals, I wanted to take a step back because the neurodiversity term, um, the, the word itself, I, I think it was, you know, it's, it's a newer term and so many people don't know what it means, right? And so it's encompassing of individuals that are both neurodivergent and neurotypical that really come together um, in this space where they're able to appreciate that difference. I love the neurodiversity movement. So the fact that you, you, you rested it, uh, Sophie, it, it just makes such a, a great deal of sense um, because there's strength within numbers and there's strength within understanding. Um, and mean, you don't understand oftentimes people reject that. And so it actually stops an opportunity from really coming into something that can be that much more rewarding for both parties. So the fact that we're even having this conversation, again, it is so very much refreshing because many companies, um, they don't know what it is. And because I don't know, I don't want to even entertain because for whatever reason, sometimes people think it's gonna take a lot and it really doesn't take as much as some individuals think um, in, in some regards. But talking about the program in particular, at least at AY, and I know that Anthony is gonna talk about his program as well, we've created an entry point for those individuals who are neurodivergent. And it does focus in on a very specific skill set. but we are you know, a technology firm that requires individuals to have certain skill sets, right? So because of that, the um, door has been open for them to come into the program, but it's not a one-stop shop for them. They have the opportunity to be able to um, transition out of the initial roles that they're in, which is not an entry level role. Um, it is a pretty um, decent sized role within the structure of the organization and then be able to maneuver throughout the entire firm based upon their credentials um, and their educational background. But the structure that we've actually created is kind of breaking down some of those barriers I've talked about initially, as far as the interview from that very first interview through the series of interviews that folks go through in order to make it that much more um, inclusive, in order for it to make it an interview that's really based upon skills and not just based on behaviors. And that process is one where we have found individuals to find so inviting and appreciative of the fact that they actually are able to showcase their talents and not just have someone focus in on, you know, how well, you know, they respond to a question that may be open-ended that really has no relevance to the actual job that has to be done. Um, the, the other thing that I want to mention before I tee to Anthony is that while we've created an opportunity, it is just that an opportunity, not just a job, because an, another uh, a misconception, if you will, that individuals are only looking for a job when in fact that anyone that's really looking to add value to a corporation is looking for a career. And we've created this to be the door that opens up so that you can actually build and grow a career within EY. But I'm gonna pause Anthony because you know I can talk about this all day. Please share. <laughs> thank you for well, bringing thanks. that up. Also Jamal, thank you for bringing that up about um, the term because I was new to this term as well. Mm -hmm. And it really was mind blowing because I think it's, like, yes, that is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a difference in thinking, yes. not a disability. Yes. Um, yes. And I think that is a mind-blowing thought process for companies, for individuals, and for, for the people themselves. Um, Absolutely. And thank you for telling me about this path. I think, um, so, so it's really about thinking about the interview process, but also the job path. Yes. for these individuals and it probably helps all individuals in the company when you're more 
focused on differences than focused on sameness. Elizabeth, that's another point. And again, I know Jan has heard this and seen this. Anthony has heard this and seen this. So many processes that we actually put in place that we are trying to create this, um, this, this, this support for individuals that are neurodivergent are actually supports that are beneficial to everyone within the organization. So it doesn't just benefit one particular population, but sometimes when you're part of the picture, you can't, you can't appreciate the beauty until you take a step back and it's when you're able to step back and say the full picture that you're able to say, okay, yeah, this is something that we didn't have a good handle on. But I think the best thing within these conversations that we continue to have is the fact that we're having the conversation, creating more awareness and more organizations or companies are wanting to see how can we start something similar or how can we make our overall processes that much more inclusive? Thank you. Anthony? Yeah, so to piggyback on everything Jamel said, but to, to add a couple of different flavors. So the last part that you're speaking of is, is universal design, right? So what's good for somebody who's neurodiverse is good for the entire firm, whether that be from a recruiting standpoint, which we've structured just like Jamel and EY, um, whether it's from an internal support structure, which EY and, and Microsoft and everybody has, and that internal support structure, whether it be a buddy, a mentor, you know, a buddy is a person who's side by side doing the same work. Somebody can reference, uh, you know, their, their counterpart uh, for questions, comments, whatever it may be to a mentor, something about the career, right? Jamel talked about opportunities just not to come in and do a job, uh, but to have longevity, durability, sustainability, like, those three things, when we're, we're teaching emerging adults, I love that, by the way, um, emerging young people, molding the minds, we want them to not just think that this is a, you know, a short-term piece. Now, there is places for that in the workforce, but we want them to think, you know, I could spend quite a bit amount of time at a firm. And I think EUI has done a wonderful job of doing that. I think we're, we're, we're with them in that capacity. Um, you know, at, at, at this particular juncture, we have 215 people um, who are on the spectrum that work for us in 40 different job roles. So when people say that, it, you know, it's, it's just IT that everybody's looking for, it's not the case. Uh, we have non-IT as well. So we're, we're about a 60-40 split meaning IT jobs versus non-IT jobs. So your, your quants, your software engineers, but your operations, your receivables, your lockboxes, your compliance, your audit. Um, and I think what we have done, and obviously it's in collaboration with Landmark and, and Jamel uh, in EY and here in EY, is we're figuring out how we do that from the start. So the structured employment is actually before somebody even gets in the door, you need the support structure built for all of the rest of the folks inside that, right? So it's your recruiters, it's your managers, it's your colleagues, it's your senior leadership. They all need to be educated, trained, whatever you want to call it. And I think, you know, we've built a robust training program. You know, managers get three hours instructor led on, on how to communicate, look at social differences, delayed processing different pieces of this, how to provide feedback. That's the structure before somebody gets, we can teach a job. For the most part, if you have even basic skill sets, we have all sorts of people that can get you that education and training to get you trained up for that job. Um, and we have three different sets of ways to get in the door. Uh, contractor, where we do short term. Uh, we have temporary workers, which is new to us. Um, and I'll tell you why that's new. It's because in government spaces, we've needed some temporary work. And for a lot of folks who just have volunteer work on their resume, this is a great thing to put on a resume. I, I'm now, I work for JP Morgan Chase for four months doing X, Y, and Z. And then you have your direct hires, which we would love to do. We want to convert everybody who comes in to a full-time employee. Um, so I think, you know, we were talking about structured employment. We have internships. Um, you know, I could go on for days. Like there's plenty of different ways that we can do this. So I'm going to stop there because I know you need to move on too. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. It you know it's, it makes such a good point too about bringing to the forefront that it's as, as diverse as people are. Neurodivergent 
are as diverse as any other group of individuals are and are capable of doing different roles in an organization. So thank you also for highlighting that. Um, Jan, I wanted to, you did, Anthony mentioned about, you know, the partnership with Landmark. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. Can you share with us about how Landmark College partners with these and other companies to support the transition of neurodivergent individuals in the workplace? Yes, absolutely. So um, really what it, it, there's, there's two prongs of it. There's the student prong where we work with Landmark's deliberately working with students to provide a scaffolded process so that they are learning what's going to be required of them in, in, in the workplace. Um, but really, like Solvegi said earlier, like knowing themselves, knowing what their strengths are, what, know what, where, what their abilities are, and how to best showcase that. Um, and then what we do is, you know, we're coaching the students through the process. We communicate with our partners. So, you know, Jamel and Anthony and I are communicating frequently throughout the academic year. Um, and then we invite the partners to campus. So they are very much part of the student's experience at Landmark College. So they um, come to campus and the students um, conduct interviews with them, get to know them. We have these great forums for conversation and questions and answers, very informal, low stress, because really what our goal is, is to build rapport because the relationship piece is huge and getting to know what's going to be expected in the work environment, what they're walking into, um, not only just for the interview process, but for the onboarding. And the work environment piece is key because they are seeing when they hear from folks like Jamel and Anthony and Michael Fieldhouse from DXC, that it's an environment that is neurodiverse friendly that they're walking into, that the, that the considerations that they need in a workplace have been applied. The, the office building itself and what the noises are and what the light is like it are ways in which they're going to feel at home, comfortable, and like they belong. That belonging piece is really important um, and they're welcomed. So that transition really is um, where we convey what they're walking into so that there's no surprises. Um, but we also teach them, you know, what they need to be working on as they're working their way through Landmark so they are ready for these opportunities. Uh, we also speak about even the nuts and bolts that may not be considered beyond just the job. Okay, so you had the job offer. How do you negotiate salary? What about your living situation? Are you ready to live alone? What do you need? What structures do you need in place? What supports do you need in place? And what's exciting about these programs that the gentleman for, you know, with us here today is they consider those pieces too. So there's the social aspect, the, the independent living aspect that are all brought into the conversation to really make that transition seamless, which is so important for this population. Absolutely, that's really important. Now, can cop, just do, do companies have to already have this set within their organization before they can work with Landmark or can they, can they reach out to Landmark and, and, and learn about how to be more um, effective and, and be, a, be a more welcome place for neurodivergent individuals? They absolutely do not need to have it in place to approach us. I mean, what, you know, one of the things that um, is exciting and both Anthony and Jamel can speak to this as well, that what we're doing now is we are, um, like Jamel said, strength in numbers. You know, we started with just a few companies that were doing this, Microsoft, you know, SAP, and now there's this beautiful ripple effect. Is is both these gentlemen have helped me train other companies. You know, we've worked with Stanley Black and Decker and a local business that's actually national, um, based locally, CNS Wholesale. We've provided trainings to them. So no, they do not need to have this in place. They need to have an interest and a willingness to embrace neurodiversity, um, but we, we, we welcome interest and, and um, the opportunity to train and bring you on board because we, we don't want this happening in little pockets. We want this happening in, in numbers. That's fantastic. And we will, I want all the attendees to know, we will be sharing Jan's information afterwards so that you can get in touch with her if you're with a company and you're interested in, in getting some of this started. Um, I, I want to ask a question to pose to all of you about mental health 
um, and what role it plays in the neurodivergent population in obtaining and retaining a job. Um, so Becky, I'd like to go to you first. Can you share your thoughts on that? Sure thing. Um, well, I worked with a student for several years who's very, very um, high level student, you know, could way outstrip me or anybody else at the college. And he had such um, self-esteem problems that he said every time he went into a college class, his stress level went up to here. You can see my hand. And it did not matter how much success he had. It was the early experiences of failure that created this triggering effect for him in school and with any other authority figure. So I'm using that as an illustrative example um, for the bigger thing, which is that neurodivergent people are well documented to have a higher level, higher rate of mental health challenges than people who are from the neurotypical population. Um, higher levels of depression and anxiety among dyslexic people, ADHD people, and autistic people. It's, you know, there's really no question about that. So when you're uh, cultivating and recruiting this population, it's important to know that those are some of the co-occurring issues that people come with. And um, I'm just taking a guess here, and, you know, folks on the panel can say if they agree with this, but entering a new situation and entering a situation where performance is going to be judged and where authority figures have a lot of power over you is probably going to exacerbate these issues. And so it's probably super important for us to be ready for them and have supports available or be able to talk about it in our workplaces and educational institutions. Important. You're nodding. Yeah. Yeah, and very important. You know, Anthony, would you would you talk about that a little bit? How mental health plays a role? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> so you couple with what somebody just said with what's going on in the world today. And I think you have a, 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 a double barrel uh, looking at you. Um, you know, we've seen instances of, you know, isolationism, anxiety during this particular time before, you know, COVID struck, um, you know, when we were coming to work and whatnot. You know, if large companies typically have some sort of employee assistance program, which, you know, has, psychologists that we can employ uh, in case there's some, you know, anxiety, which there always is. And listen, honestly, I have anxiety, but it is nothing compared to what some of these folks are coming in with. Um, and at the very forefront of trying to do that, we're, we're alleviating a little bit of that stress. Chan talked about the application process, right? Um, which is just jarring, you know, we're allowing advocates, right, as a reasonable accommodation, whether it's filling out the application, whether it's coming in for the interview process so that they can sit behind or beside, um, whether it's a performance appraisal, uh, that's a little bit newer, uh, kind of, you know, figuring out and navigating uh, with that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things that we're employing now, but I think, you know, we've developed strategies over the past seven or eight months just for COVID anxiety strategies and isolationism. Like we have guidelines and who to call and what to do and steps for managers, which is important for them to understand, you know, if performance is going down because of X, Y, and Z, how do I tackle that as a manager? Um, so, you know, there's two sides to everything. And, and listen, I could talk about this piece about uh, for, for hours, like Jamel can talk about other pieces for hours. Um, but I think we've done a decent job of trying to alleviate because we're not going to eliminate. I would love to say that we're going to eliminate all anxiety and, and stressors and everything triggers, not gonna happen. But we also need to educate ourselves on how we deal with that, right? So neurotypical people reaching out to folks who are neurodiverse and saying, okay, understand this, let's go do this. Here's our game plan for today. All right, you're feeling that you're at a five and you know you want to be a two. Um, here's how we get to a two and we provide guidance on how to do that. So I'm going to stop right there and I think uh, Jamel can probably add on to what I just said. Yes, I'm sure. Jamel, please. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, Jamel, you're on mute. Uh, there you okay. go. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, to Anthony's point, we, this is, you know, areas that we love to kind of talk about, right? Because it, it, it is the 
foundation for the success of our team members that are neurodivergent as well as those that are neurotypical. And within EY, we like to use the term that's called psychological safety. And when an individual is um, safe from a psychological perspective, you can actually have innovation, you have teaming, you have a true sense of belonging, a person that feels as though not just I belong to the organization, I actually am part of that organization. And when there are uh, mental health issues that kind of challenge that sense of psychological safety, you start to see different declines, whether it be in performance, whether it be in interactions and teaming and, and a host of other um, examples that I could share. But I think the most important thing is that there is definitely a direct tie to mental health and the uh, neurodivergent population and ensuring that there is an opportunity for individuals to come in to not just bring themselves, but to be in an environment where um, they feel comfortable even making a mistake, they feel comfortable knowing that while there is difference, I'm still a part. So the difference doesn't exclude me, it still includes me. That's a really good point. And you know, the awareness, ha having employers aware that the neurodiverse population is gonna be coming in with a larger um, mental, mental health issue potentially is an important piece of it. And, and particularly now, I think now is a great time to discuss it because I think employers are becoming more and more aware of that because people are under so much stress um, in the general population and in, in every population. So, um, you know, now is a great time to discuss it and think about it in your company um, and, and particularly when you're neurodivergent. Jan, what can, can you- I, uh, Can I put, butt in before Jan and just add one that you, your comments made me think of? And that is that when neurodivergent people can be out about who they are and not have to hide, that takes a big burden off of yeah. them. And this is something that, you know, I've heard many times in my line of work that it takes a lot of psychic energy to try to hide the fact of your neurodiversity. And so if your workplace isn't allowing you to be open, then that's going to really affect your mental health. Um, so I would imagine that you at least can mitigate the issues by being so open and having that support. Thanks Thank for Thank you. Thank you for jumping in with that. Jan, can you add any add something to the discussion about the mental health piece? No, I think I just simply like what Solvegi said is is um, the ability to bring the whole self to work. That 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 these um, their differences are not something that they have to keep um, hidden and, and, and particularly that the whole camouflaging, that, that, that the being an environment where they don't need to camouflage, sometimes women, women on the spectrum, that's, they, they're more often uh, less apt to share and to say, talk about their diagnosis. Um, and so I think when that, when they see other people be willing to embrace their neurodiversity, it does create a culture where um, there's a lot more comfort in, in, in speaking about it. And, and one is strengths. You know, we always emphasize the strengths of it, you know, so that they, they can feel confident rather than, um, like we mentioned earlier, that it, it's something that has, needs to be hidden or that it's a disability. Thank you. Thank you for that. Jamel, Anthony, um, Jan, what tips do you have for if a workplace wants to be more neurodiversity inclusive? What would be some of the good ways to get started? Jamel, you want to get started with that? Yeah, I was going to say, let me, let me just jump in here and say, I think that, you know, when you are looking to hire or looking to increase the, the number of individuals that are neurodivergent in your, your company and you have a specific program for them, that's really great. Um, and starting small and receiving sponsorship from your executives is absolutely positively clear. It needs to be a part of what's important for the organization. Um, and if that messaging is shared more broadly, it is that much more palatable for individuals to embrace. I will kind of just share this openly and honestly though, many organizations already have individuals that are neurodivergent in their populations already. They just are not out because there is this stigma and stigma is a nice way of saying um, discrimination that's associated with individuals that are neurodivergent. So I think that again, conversations like this, as we continue to have them, it helps to again, create knowledge, awareness and reduce that stigma so that people can be that much more open about who they are 
and not mask or attempt to camouflage because I heard a couple of individuals um, refer to it as it is mentally exhausting where you're looking um, like you're pretending to be someone you're not the entire day. And so you're not really getting full use of your, your, your brain power because portions of that is meant to mask or to, again, pretend to be someone that I'm really not. And I, I, that to me just always resonated when I heard it years ago. And I said, that has to be just, just grueling to pretend to be something that you're not for the sake of trying to fit in, so horrible for the person and also thinking about from the company perspective you're not getting the most from that individual i mean all of this yes this is supporting neurodivergent individuals but also this is supporting your company you know you're you're opening your company to individuals that can bring so much and you want all of them just like you do from all of your employees absolutely absolutely i wanted to make that point too um anthony can you share with us about that started and some tips yeah so so i think there's jamal and i again we do this all the time and and there's one other piece of that you can actually email or call jamal or i and we will talk to you about how we started our program right so it's always wonderful to hear from other companies who are doing this whether they're large or small um and you know we have the employers round table with microsoft dxc uh, Ford, and I'm missing like 30 others. Jan, you, you probably know some of them as well. Um, but you're, you know, as Jan said earlier, you should be reaching out to Jan as well. So, it's, you know, the the senior leadership buy-in is always, you know, you, you, you have somebody who's really focused on starting a neurodiversity program, and they, they don't know where to start. Um, so talking to us first is always good, because we can actually go talk to your senior leadership. So if you said you had somebody from EY or JP Morgan Chase who is on the horn or would love to have a warm introduction with you on, on how to start a neurodiversity program or they want to speak to their CDO, um, you know, chief diversity officer, we are all for that. Uh, you have a network of individuals who can help you ascertain how to go about finding potentially vendors who can help you source talent, um, getting you in touch with these wonderful colleges and universities like Landmark uh, to find some of that hotbed talent. Uh, like there's all of these little parts that we can kind of provide to you. There's actually a playbook in order to start your own neuro neurodiversity program. And Jan is showing it right on the screen right now. So she is super good about this. Um, and so, boy, you can tell we do this. Uh, you know, so it's, it's wonderful that we have this huge network. And I say it's a huge network. It is a huge network, but we all know each other. So it's a small network. Uh, so, you know, I implore anybody who wants to do any of this to talk about it, just to reach out. It's that easy. Terrific. And remember one more thing, Elizabeth. Yeah. All of us on this, well, at least Jamel and I, <laughs> we shouldn't be doing these jobs in five or 10 years. This should be built into the DNA of every single company, mom or pop, large or small, about how they bring in talent, right? If we can do this right, right now, I think we set ourselves up for, you know, five or 10 years from now of not having to have these conversations and it just being a part of what we do each and every day. Yes, I love that. I love that. Jan, can you share a little bit about, you know, I know you shared a little bit about with Landmark College, but what other tips can you give companies that want to get started? I think a lot of it's been covered, Elizabeth. I mean, I think starting small, um, you know, knowing, knowing who the resources are, the resources that we shared in the chat, um, reach out to us. I mean, I have delivered trainings. Um, Sylvagi and I have delivered trainings in collaboration. We're, the college very much wants to support this effort, whether it's we are going, you know, huge company wise um, or just a local business that wants to um, embrace neurodiversity. So I think um, the supervisors are the key piece. You know, it, sometimes you can start with one or two supervisors, equipping them um, and giving them the tools to um, support individuals and, and what are the structures that they need. But People can absolutely reach out to us, and and you know we have we have resources that we can easily share. Um, but start the dialogue, and, and what are some of the steps? But don't 
but don't be apprehensive because you're not alone. You're going to get the support you need. And we've found that with many of the businesses that we have began the dialogue with and then have referred to, um, to Jamel and Anthony. And now they're off and running. You know, it's, it's exciting to see that. Fantastic. And I will share everyone's contact information. We will send out an email in 24 hours and we'll include everyone's contact information there. I know I'm already getting a lot of uh, chats that people are interested in, which is wonderful and exactly what we, what we wanted. So you'll get that. Don't worry. We also are recording this. And uh, the link will be available on the Schneps Media YouTube channel. So you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to share it within your company, outside of your company, um, and with all different individuals. So I want to get to uh, just a couple of our questions. Um, this has been so incredible and informative. And I, I thank you all for, for your expertise. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, Sarah wanted to know, are there any organizations in the city to help autistic children find employment in decent locations? Um, there seems to be a lot of organizations addressing the autistic problem, as she's calling it, but not enough to place these children in work. Um, and I think that's kind of what we've been, we've been talking about here, which is um, you know, reaching out to Landmark and reaching out to Jamel and Anthony and these and companies that are ahead of the curve. Um, is there anything else that you know you can share? I guess for for parents and individuals who are looking for help, um, you know, you've been so generous with with your time, and I know that's important to you. Um, Jan, you're just on mute. Sorry, can they, you hear me now? All right. Um, for that individual, I I often recommend um, reaching out to Voc Rehab, vocational rehab. As, as the starting point, um, because then they can network you to the organizations in um, your geographic area. Um, there are particularly, it's a little bit challenging sometimes in rural Vermont, um, but in bigger metropolitan areas, there are many resources um, for job placement and um, just that whole navigating the, the steps to finding employment if an individual is not you know, going to college and they can't connect with their career office. Um, but I would highly recommend Voc Rehab. There's organizations like Integrate um, that work, they, they provide trainings to big corporations, um, but they also um, connect individuals to the right workplace um, opportunities that are neurodiverse friendly. Those are some great ideas. Thank you so much. I'll add one. It may not serve the New York area, but the um, Asperger Autism Network of New England, A-A-N-E, is neighboring and they do exactly what Jan's talking about. So they may, that organization may have connections to an organization that's similar in New York, A-A-N-E. Terrific. I'm going to put that right now in the chat, A-A-N-E. And you said it was integrate. I'm gonna put that in the chat too, just so everybody. Um, let me get to another question here. Um, oh, so someone was asking, does the government encourage employment of autistic children and give tax breaks or perks to companies that employ them? It, does government get involved in supporting this, this movement? Mel, you wanna go or do you want me to go? I was going to say, yeah, you know, so quite honestly, we are asked this question often if there's um, breaks for companies that receive uh, or that employ those who are on the spectrum or who are neurodivergent. And I would say that there is a credit that any organization would get based upon a person who um, has a, a, a disability, if you will. Um, but that is not the reason why um, many companies are focused within this space. And the reason why I call that out specifically is because unfortunately, Within, within the movement, you know, there has been um, maybe not the best experiences for some. And so while there is this underwritten thought that maybe this is why companies are doing this, this is not the reason at all. I can tell you that we are doing it because this is an untapped talent pool. We are doing this because it actually helps to meet a business imperative that we have. We do this not even under the guise from a diversity and inclusion perspective, not under the guise of a corporate social responsibility perspective. We do this because our clients have said, we need these individuals with uh, a certain type of skill set. And it just so happens that some of the individuals in our neurodivergent community 
have portions of that skill set and we can bind that neurodivergent mindset skill set with those who are neurotypical to deliver for our clients. So yes, there is a benefit that individuals may receive um, if they hire a person with disability, but they may receive a quote unquote tax benefit if they hire a veteran. So it, 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 there are benefits that come, but the benefits are not um, substantial at all. Thank you for that. And Anthony, is there something that you, else you can share? Because I think that's a really key point that we didn't, we didn't address too much, but there's tremendous benefits for companies for having this, this employment pool. Um, this is not just about being nice. This is about value to the company. Um, Anthony, can you share some of that with, with us? Yeah, so there's, I, I think we talk about metrics a lot. We always talk about how many people we employ, you know, what our retention rate is, where we are in the world. The one thing that we don't talk about enough is how much of a culture shift that we have in our organizations when we hire diverse employees, and especially, especially those who are neurodiverse, because we have a whole set of 10 neurotypicals sitting on a table doing the same thing, thinking the same way. Um, you know, they've gone throughout their whole life doing just that. And then we bring somebody in who's a little bit neurodivergent. We get, uh, you know, some training, some education. And then all of a sudden we see the person who might have autism become more social because now they're being invited to go out to, you know, different events and engage. And maybe at first it doesn't happen. But I, one quick story is um, a young man who was married. Um, his team would always ask him to, to, to go out to, to dart night on a Wednesday. Um, and he would never do it. And they kept asking him just every politely every week. And one day he said, yeah, I'll go, but can I bring my wife with me? They're like, sure. So now every Wednesday at dart night, the whole team gathers, not, not during COVID, obviously. So go with that. That was pre-COVID. But they're, dr they're drinking beers and having a good time, right? So, so some, this gentleman is now more socially uh, aware and out there and doing things. His teammates understood of his neurodivergence, never pressured, always asked, made sure he was included. And eventually, you know, in his case, he was one of, you know, many team members who is, you know, now having a good time with everybody else. Like there's, there's so many different stories, people living independently, driver's licenses, people getting married. I have a couple who is having a child in May, like this is crazy stuff. And I can tell you five years ago, wasn't happening. Love it. Anthony, can I just piggyback there real quick off of some of the you, you said because this the, the social aspects of it and that personal component, um, it, it is so impactful, right? Individuals who did not have um, quote unquote friends um, or a large number of friends at work or even at all now find themselves being that much more social. But from a business perspective, let me tell you that the benefits that we receive from hiring this talent with this different skill set, you know, they've been able to um, work on a nine week blockchain sprint that has global implication. It's actually helping global institutions. Um, you know, um, one set of team members that we had built a platform for data visualization but ultimately identified $300 million in savings for the organization. So this is tremendous talent being applied internally where we are getting the benefit, our clients are getting the benefit and we pay our team members a very competitive wage. So there is both business application, there's personal application, there's community application. So there are so many win, win, wins. You know, we often say, why, why would you not consider this? Why would you not? look to hire again this untapped talent pool. Wow. I mean I think that's an incredible place to to stop, to end, because I think that really encompasses so much about what we're talking about here, uh, the benefit of working with the neurodiverse population um, in the workplace is a benefit to the neurodiverse and a benefit to the workplace. And I want to thank you all. We really could have, could have been talking all afternoon. There's so much great stuff here. But I want to thank you all for bringing your expertise um, and sharing all of this with us and educating us 
And uh, thank you to all the attendees for being here. As I said, I promise I will get out to you all of their contact information so you can take this information and run with it in your own company, your own family, your own life. So thank you all for joining us. I wish you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and looking forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.